Hi guys, it's Ashraf from WizEdu and today we're going to be doing an introduction to trigonometry. So what exactly is trigonometry? Many people get scared when they hear the word trigonometry. We've all been told horror stories about how difficult trig is. However, after watching our videos, I hope you'll come to see that trig isn't really that hard. In order to learn trigonometry, we have to understand exactly what it is in the first place. And I think the best way to go about doing this is to dissect what trig actually means. So on the screen, you can see I've divided the word trigonometry up into three parts, and we're going to find the meaning of each different part. So the first bit, tree, is pretty simple. That just means three. The next bit is slightly more difficult, gone, but it's not something we haven't encountered before because in school we've learnt about polygons and hexagons and a whole lot of other shapes. And basically the gone refers to the number of angles in the shape. So a hexagon, for example, would have six angles within it. And the last bit, ometry, is derived from the word metric, which means to measure. So trigonometry basically is the measurement of three angled shapes. And trigonometry as a concept isn't something new to us. We've been doing this since primary school. For example, we learnt about equilateral triangles. And we learnt that in an equilateral triangle, all the sides are the same length and also if all the sides are the same length then all the angles are also the same and in this case they'll all be 60 degrees. We've also learnt about isosceles triangles. We know that if two sides of a triangle are equal in length then the triangle is an isosceles triangle and the relationship to the angle of the triangle then is that the two base angles of the triangle are equal. And finally, in grade 8, we learnt about the theorem of Pythagoras. We learnt that in right angle triangles, there's a relationship between the two sides of the triangle and its hypotenuse. So the squares of the two sides, the sum of the squares of two sides of the triangle are equal to the square of the hypotenuse. So you can see now that trigonometry isn't something new. But this is just the tip of the iceberg. The bread and butter of trigonometry lies in the relationship between the ratios of the sides of a triangle and the angles within a triangle. So just to explain this concept, I have three triangles on the screen. And you can see in these three triangles, there's a relationship between the hypotenuse and each the length of the side of the triangle. So you can see that 8 is double 4, and 14 is double 7, and 22 is double 11. So you can see the ratio between the lengths of one side of each triangle and the hypotenuse is the same. So what's the implication of this? on the angles of each of these triangles. Well, in the first triangle, the angle is 30 degrees, okay? And in the second triangle, because the ratio between the side of the triangle and the hypotenuse is the same as the previous triangle, the angle is also 30 degrees. And the same goes for the last triangle. So you can see in trigonometry, there's a definitive relationship between the ratios of sides of the triangles and the angles within these triangles. Speaking of right angle triangles, I think now would be a good time to revise the theorem of Pythagoras. So in grade 8, most of us learnt that a squared plus b squared is equal to c squared, where a and b are two sides of a triangle, here and here, and c is the hypotenuse. So basically what we learnt was a squared plus b squared is equal to c squared. 
So just to consolidate and reacquaint ourselves with the theorem of Pythagoras, let's just do a couple examples. So in this triangle, we can see that we're given the value of two sides of the triangle, but we don't know the hypotenuse. The hypotenuse is x. But this is no problem to us at all because we know that a squared plus b squared is equal to c squared. So we can easily solve for x. So we just write down 20 squared plus 21 squared is equal to x squared. And remember to write in your reason Pythagoras. Okay. Now 20 squared is 400. 21 squared is 441. And that's all equal to x squared. The sum of 441. 400 and 441 is 841 and that's all equal to x squared but we don't want x squared do we we are looking for x so we have to get rid of this exponent over here so how we do that is we square root both sides so the square root of 841 is equal to the square root of x squared and the square root of 841 is 29. So we have x as 29. That wasn't that difficult, was it? So let's try an example in which we know the hypotenuse, but one of the sides of the triangle is unknown. So basically to do this, we're going to have to rearrange the equation. So what we know is that y squared plus 15 squared equals 17 squared because 17 is the hypotenuse in this case and let's write in our reason always remember your reason guys especially in exams okay so now we want to find y so we'll make that the subject of the formula so we'll take the 15 across so 17 squared minus 15 squared and now y squared will be equal to 289 minus 225. So that is 64. And again, we want to find y, not y squared. So we get rid of the exponent by square rooting both sides. So we get y to being equal to 8. So we found y as 8. Okay, so let's do one final example. In this example, we also given the value of the hypotenuse again, and we need to find the value of one of the sides, which is unknown. In this case, it's z. So let's just write out the equation. z squared plus 7 squared is equal to 25 squared. Reason being Pythagoras, okay? And now when I'm manipulating the equation this time to make z the, the subject of the formula, I'm going to do something a bit different. I'm going to do it much faster. I'm immediately going to take over my square root and my 7. So 25, the root of 25 squared minus 7 squared. And I can put that straight into my calculator to get the answer of 24. So z is 24. So you can see I've cut out quite a few steps by manipulating the equation differently from the last time. So this can save you quite a bit of time in the exam while still getting all the marks. In trigonometry, we'll mostly be using Pythagoras in the context of a Cartesian plane. So on a Cartesian plane, you have your x and your y axes. Okay, and let's say we have the point 5, 12, where 5 is our x value and 12 is our y value. We can plot this point on the Cartesian and draw a triangle from this, okay? So the horizontal line here would represent our x, or in this case, its value would be 5, and the vertical line would, the vertical line would represent y, and in this case, it's 12. So the hypotenuse here, I'm going to label as R for radius. And I'll explain to you guys a little later why I'm calling it the radius. 
even though this is not a circle and we're dealing with a triangle. Okay, so from Pythagoras, we know that x squared, because this is x over here, and y is this one here, x squared plus y squared is going to give us r squared, okay? So we can just substitute our values for x and y in. We have x as 5 and y as 12. That's going to give us r squared. Just put our reason here. Pythagoras, okay? 5 squared is 25. 12 squared is 144. That's equal to r squared. The sum of these two is 169. And we will just go and square root both sides to get rid of our exponents. And we get r as being 13. So we found r and it's 13. Now we're not only going to be dealing with points in the first quadrant. We can also have triangles in the second quadrant. In this case, or this example rather, we've been given the value of r, the hypotenuse, and we have x, but y is our unknown. So over here, we have x, negative 8, and y is our unknown. So we're going to have to rearrange the equation in this case. From our normal equation, x squared plus y squared equals r squared, we're going to have to make y the subject of the formula. Now all we do is merely substitute our variables in. So y squared equals 17 squared minus minus 8 squared. Let's just put brackets around the 17. It's always a good habit when you're substituting variables in to substitute them in with the brackets. Although in this case, because we're squaring, the negative wouldn't make a difference. It's always a good habit to have. So y squared would be equal to 289 minus 64. So y squared would be equal to 225. We can square root both sides. Okay. And we have y is equal to 15. For our last example, we'll be dealing with a triangle in the third quadrant. So the point we are given is x and minus 24. So in this case, we have our y value, but we're missing our x value. And our radius is 25. So we can rearrange our equation again. So from our original, we make x the subject of the formula. Let's substitute our variables in. And remember to retain brackets. So 25 squared minus minus 24 squared. Okay. And if you want, we can just take that square away there. And we can immediately square root just to go straight to our answer. It just saves quite a bit of time. So x would be 7. So we found x to be 7. Okay, so we know that the angle that's going to be opposite the right angle is our hypotenuse. Let's say we consider the angle over here. Okay, this side here that's next to the angle is referred to as the side adjacent to that angle. Whereas the side that's over here is directly opposite that angle. So we refer to it as the opposite side. But what happens in a triangle where we want to talk about this angle here? Would the references remain the same or change? Well, this is still going to be the hypotenuse because it's still opposite our right angle. But our angle over here now this is the side next to our angle. So this is going to become our adjacent side. And over here, this is the side that's going to be opposite our angle. So it's the opposite side. 
As I said earlier, trigonometry is all about the relationship between the ratios of sides and the angles within a triangle. So let's just quickly draw a triangle here so we can visualize these ratios easily. So I have my right angle triangle here. Let's consider this angle. Let's call it theta. This would be our adjacent side. This would be the opposite side. And the, ang the side opposite the 90 degrees is the hypotenuse. So basically, if we want to explain sine, sine of an angle would be the ratio of the length of the side of the opposite side to the length of the hypotenuse. So sine relates the opposite side to the hypotenuse. Cos will relate the adjacent side to the hypotenuse. And tan relates the opposite side to the adjacent side. And the easy way to remember these ratios is through Soka Toa, in which S stands for sine. And obviously you can see you have the O over H here. C stands for cos. You have your A over H there. And T is for tan. And you have your O over A there. But in trigonometry, we don't only have these three ratios. In fact, we have six because each of these ratios has a sibling. So sine sibling is cosec. And you can see how they related. Where sine is O over H, cosec is the reciprocal H over O. Cos is A over H, whereas sec, which stands for secant, is H over A. Tan is O over A. And cot is A over O. Cot standing for cotangent. Okay. Whilst it's very easy to learn the ratios in terms of Soka Toa, it's much more helpful to learn them in terms of the variables x, y, and r, especially since we're going to be dealing a lot with the Cartesian plane. So just to visualize this again, I'm going to draw a set of axes, the x and y planes, and plot an arbitrary point, x, y, just so we can visualize this. So we still have our radius, we have our x and our y, and this would be our angle theta. So you can see that y is still opposite, r is still the hypotenuse because here's our right angle, and x would be adjacent. So sine is still o over h, cos is still a over h, and tan is still o over a, okay? And we still have the same relationships. We have our reciprocals. And also now we're introducing co-functions. Cot and tan are interesting in that they're both reciprocals and co-functions. And we'll go through a bit later what co-functions mean. Sine and cos are also co-functions, as well as cosec and sec. And basically the easy way to find a co-function is to just stick a co in front of any trig function. So let's say you wanted to find the co-function of sine. Just put a co in front and you get cosine, which is cos. Or for example, you wanted the co-function of cosec. Just stick a co in front, it becomes cococec. Now cococec sounds like nothing we've done before. So if there's a coco, you just cancel that out and you get sec. So this is the memory technique we're going to be using. If you want to find a co-function, stick a co in front. If there's a co-co, it cancels out. So final example, you want the co-function for tan. Just stick a co in front. You get cotan, which is cot, right? This pyramid is showing us the relationship between tan sine and cos and what it's basically saying is that tan theta is equal to sine theta over cos theta and we're going to be using this a lot 
when we do trig equations and trig identities and we'll be mainly replacing tan with sine over cos. And I just want to show you guys why this works. So we've just done the ratios and their definitions. So if we want to prove that sine over cos is equal to tan, we just replace sine theta with y over r and cos theta with x over r. And if we simplify this, we have y over r times r over x and that equals y over x and from our previous slide we know that tan theta is also equal to y over x we could have also done this in terms of o h and a but the final result would have been the same so in trig we're going to be dealing a lot with the cartesian plane so we have our normal x and y axes but the addition in trig is that we also have degrees. So we have our zero degrees starting on the right, then 90, 180, 270, and 360. And as you can see, we always move in an anti-clockwise direction. Now it's very important not to get confused between our Matt's Cartesian plane and our physics bearing diagram. As you can see, they're both very similar in that they have two sets of axes and they have angles on them. Now, the Matt's Cartesian plane operates in an anti-clockwise direction and you can see the zero starts on the right. Whereas the physics plane, the zero is on the top and it goes clockwise. So it's very important that when you're doing vectors and other sections in physics, you don't switch over to mats. So you can see that the mat zero degrees starts on the right and goes anti-clockwise, whereas physics starts on the top and goes clockwise. So the memory technique I like to use is that mats is always right and science is tops. So what this refers to is that science starts at the top your zero is here at the top and mats starts on the right. So you start your zero on the right. And you just have to find a way to remember that mats goes anti-clockwise and physics goes clockwise. So as you can see, on the Cartesian plane, we have four quadrants. Our first quadrant is zero to 90 degrees. Our second quadrant is 90 degrees to 180 degrees. The third quadrant is 180 to 270, and fourth, 270 to 360. So let's just get a feel for the trig Cartesian plane by plotting some angles on it. So we have the angle 40 degrees, and that's going to go into the first quadrant because 40 degrees is between 0 degrees and 90 degrees. So round about here we can make a point and we can draw up our radius, our vertical and our horizontal. So this is our 40 degrees, this is our x, y and r and this would be the point x, y. Okay. Next example, we have 120 degrees. Now, which quadrant is that going to be in? Well, 120 degrees is between 90 degrees and 180 degrees. So it will fall into the second quadrant, okay? So now, outside the first quadrant, you have to be careful when labeling your angle. So we have our triangle here, okay? We have our X y and r and our point x y now the angle always starts from the positive x axis and goes anti clockwise okay so we have our angle starting here 
and going all the way around to the radius. So our angle 120 degrees is here because the angle wouldn't be in the triangle. That would be wrong because 120 degrees wouldn't fit there. That's very visual. You can see that. So the angle always starts at the positive x-axis and goes anti-clockwise. So let's do one final example. 211 degrees. That's going to reside in the third quadrant because 211 is between 180 and 270. So we can plot a point here in the third quadrant and we can draw our lines our vertical, our hypotenuse, and our horizontal. And this is our x, y, and that's our r. We have our point. And as I said in the last slide, the angle always starts at the positive x-axis and goes all the way around to the radius. So this is our angle theta. It's all the way around from the positive x-axis to the radius, okay? In the last few examples, we've just been plotting angles on the Cartesian plane. But what if we wanted to plot specific points? Well, here's the method to go about doing that. If we get a point, we're basically only going to be getting two variables. So we'll have to use Pythagoras to find the third variable. So let's say you get a point 5, 12, and you wanted to plot that. You'd have to find your r, which would be separate from Pythagoras. Then you'd also have to identify the correct quadrant to place the point in. There may be a restriction in the question, or you'll have to look at the signs of the ratio itself to find out which quadrant the point lies in. Lastly, we'll plot them in the appropriate quadrant. So let's look at this example here. We are told that sine theta equals 6 over 12 and theta is less than 90 degrees. So what exactly does this mean, theta is less than 90 degrees? Well, basically, that's an indication to us that the angle we are dealing with lies in the first quadrant because it's less than 90 degrees. So our first step would be to find the third variable. So we know that sine theta is 6 over 12. That's given to us in the question. And we also know the definition of sine. We know that it's y over r. So from this, we can imply that y is 6 and r is 12. So it's easy for us to find x using Pythagoras. Okay, r squared is x squared plus y squared. Pythagoras. And we can find x is the root of r squared minus y squared. So x would be the root of 12 squared minus 6 squared. x is equal to 6 root 3. Okay. So now we merely plot our point on the graph. We have the point as being 6 root 3 and... 6 because our x is 6 root 3 and y was 6 okay so we can plot that point here in the first quadrant as our angles less than 90 degrees we can just drop our vertical our y value is 6 our x value is 6 root 3 and our r value was given to us as 12. We have our 90 here and as I said before the angle theta is from the positive x-axis to the radius. So theta would be this angle here. In the next example we given cos theta equals 4 over 5 and theta is an element of 0 to 90 degrees. Okay? So this is a different way of writing out the restriction. And it's the same as saying 
theta is between 0 and 90 degrees. These different notations we would have learned in inequalities. So cos theta equals 4 over 5. And we know from our ratios that the definition of cos is x over r. So we can imply from this that x is 4 and r is 5. So we're missing y. So we solve for y through Pythagoras. So r squared equals x squared plus y squared. Pythagoras. Okay. Now make y the subject of the formula. Just going to do this quickly. r squared minus x squared. So you can substitute right in to solve y. So r was 5 x was 4 and this is a simple Pythagorean triple we have y is equal to 3 so we have our three variables we have the points our point is going to be 4 comma 3 because x is 4 and y we found to be 3 so we plot that here in the first quadrant because we know theta is between 0 and 90 degrees we have the point 4 comma 3 we can drop our vertical our y is 3 our x is 4 and r was given to us as 5 and theta is this angle here from the positive x-axis to the radius in the next example we have tan theta equals 3 over 4 and theta is less than 90 degrees. So we're still in the first quadrant because theta is less than 90. So tan theta is equal to 3 over 4. And from our ratios, we know that the definition of tan is y over x. So we imply from this that y is 3 and x is 4. So from Pythagoras, we can solve for r. Okay. So r would be the root of 3 squared plus 4 squared. r is 5. Right? So we just plot our point. 4, 3. We can drop our vertical our radius and our horizontal we have 4 3 and we've calculated the radius to be 5 so this example is very familiar to us the ratio is the same as the first question we did when we were plotting points on a Cartesian except our restriction is different we are told that theta lies between 90 degrees and 180 degrees that's the definition for the second quadrant. So our theta will lie in the second quadrant. So somewhere over here. So I'm not going to bother to do the calculations again because we know that y is 6, r is 12, and x would be 6 root 3. We've already calculated this. So we can just plot these points on the graph except that now we in the second quadrant so if this is our x-axis and this is our y-axis this is the negative part of our x-axis so x won't be positive 6 root 3 anymore it will be negative and I'm just going to show you guys quickly why in our final step when we're solving for x we square root so we say said that x equaled the root of r squared minus y squared whenever you square root something there's always a plus and a minus here and in this case we have to select the negative because we are going to be dealing with the second quadrant so our point this time round will be negative 6 root 3 and 6 our radius will remain the same remember that a radius can never be negative because r is a length okay so it's only x and y that can be negative 
So if we plot our points here, negative 6, root 3, and 6, we can drop our vertical. Okay, that's going to be 6. Our radius is still 12, it's always positive. And this here would be negative 6, root 3. Okay? So in this example, we are told that tan theta equals 3 over negative 4. So we can put in our definition for tan as y over x, and then we can infer that y is positive 3 and x is negative 4. Now from this, we can deduce that we can't be working in quadrants 1 or 4. Now why is that? Well, we know that x is negative 4. So on the right side of the y-axis, x is positive. Now we know from the question x is negative, so we must be, dealing, must be working on the left side of the y-axis. And we also know that y is equal to positive 3. So we can't be working in quadrant 3 either, because over here, y is negative. So we must be working here where y is positive and x is negative. So let's use Pythagoras to find r. Okay, now r is a length, so it's always positive. And because 3 and 4 is a Pythagorean triple, I'm just going to say that r is 5. If you guys want, you can work it out. So I'm just going to plot our point here in the second quadrant. X being negative 4 and Y being positive 3. Our R value is 5. Okay. Our Y value is 3. And X was negative 4. And remember our angle always starts from the positive X axis and goes around to the radius. So this is our angle theta over here. So as you may have noticed, each of the trig ratios can either be positive or negative depending on which quadrant it's in because x and y can be positive or negative. But remember that r is a length Okay, and that's always positive because it's a scalar, a length. That's from physics. So in quadrant 4, cos is always positive. In quadrant 1, all the trig ratios are positive. In quadrant 2, sine is positive. And quadrant 3, tan is positive. And this is where the cast rule comes in. It's basically an easy way for us to remember where each of the trig ratios are positive and where they're negative. So you can see we start C here, then we go to A, then S, and then T. So that's how we spell out cast. And remember that cast always starts in quadrant 4. So don't, in a rush in an exam, if you're trying to find out where each ratio is positive, start cast in quadrant 1. That is not correct. It always starts in quadrant 4 and goes anti-clockwise. Okay, so now we can just see where our x's and y's are positive because this is our x-axis and that's our y-axis. Okay, so we're just going to find out where each of the trig ratios is positive and where it's negative. So we know that sine is y over r, so we'll look wherever y is positive. Remember, r is always positive as it's a length and it's a scalar and can never be negative. Okay, so y is positive over here, so sine would always be positive in quadrants 1 and 2. And the remaining quadrants it would be negative in, that's 3 and Four. The definition of cos is x over r. So cos would be positive wherever x is positive. 
So x is positive over here and over here. So cos is positive in quadrants 1 and quadrant 4 and then negative in quadrants 2 and 3 because that's where x would be negative. Tan, the definition is y over x. Now this is slightly more complicated because we have to look where y and x are both positive and y and x are both negative in order to find out where tan is positive. So tan is going to be positive in quadrant 1 because x and y are positive there. And in the third quadrant, we have x and y being negative. So tan would also be positive there, and it would be negative in the remaining quadrants. That's 2 and 4. In trigonometry, we have something called negative angles. And whenever you see a negative angle, it's always a good idea to convert it to its positive twin. So how do you go about doing this? Well, basically all you do is you take the negative angle and you add 360 degrees to it. It's not that difficult. So for example, we had sine negative 330 degrees. If we wanted to find its positive twin, all we do is add 360 degrees to the negative 330 and we get sine positive 30 degrees. If we take another example, for example, cos negative 210 degrees, if we wanted to find its positive twin, all we do is say cos negative 210 degrees and add on our 360 and that gives us cos positive 150 degrees. It's as easy as that. Special angles are commonly used angles in trigonometry. So these are used in many questions and you expect it to know these off by heart because you might get a question in an exam paper that says solve the following problem without the use of a calculator. So technically you aren't allowed to use a calculator to find the value of these and these are something you just have to know. So sine 30 degrees, the value of that is a half. The value of cos 30 degrees is root 3 over 2. Tan 30 is 1 over root 3. Sine 45 is 1 over root 2 and cos 45 is the same. Tan 45 degrees is 1. Sine 60 degrees is the same as cos 30. It's root 3 over 2. Cos 60 is the same as sine 30, which is half. And tan 60 degrees is just root 3. Now, you have to know these because if you do use your calculator, you can be caught out in an exam. And what do I mean by this? Well, let's say you punched sine 45 degrees into your calculator. What it would give you is root 2 over 2. Now that has a rationalized denominator. What do I mean by that? Well, if you look at the denominator here, I have it as 2. But in my table, I wrote 1 over root 2. That's absurd, so it's irrational. Basically, what your calculator has done is it has automatically rationalized the denominator. And these two are both equal, so sine 45, 1 over root 2 is the same as root 2 over 2. And why is that? Well, basically, 1 over root 2 multiplied by root 2 over 2, root 2, equals root 2 over 2. And this root 2 over 2 over here is 1 because these two cancel. So you're basically multiplying by 1. You're changing how it looks. So these all have twins. Okay? And you can use them interchangeably, but I like to use the ones that have unrationalized denominators because it makes it easy to cancel thirds when you're dealing with long 
identities or simplifications of trig expressions. And also it indicates to the examiner that you haven't used your calculator when you've answered this question. Thank you.